When I think of the future, I think of agile, autonomous and connected. The factories of the future will blueprint the way we live, work and eat. The factories will play a very pivotal role to meet the challenges of today. The opportunity to have a great impact on people's lives doesn't come by very often in many industries. No problem is too trivial. The simplest stuff is the most difficult to solve. It's not only just a day-to-day -day job because I can help the world and help the environment. We cannot underestimate human ingenuity. The possibilities are endless. We are at the dawn of the fourth industrial revolution. And in the decades ahead, we will see the transformation of the world and even the reinvention of humanity. I cannot imagine a life without chocolate. It's so unique, it's so complex. The way that it melts in the mouth is super, super satisfying. When you consume it, it releases some endorphins. And that's the way of our brain to let our body know, yes, you did something good. It's a wonderful experience. Barry Calabout is the world's largest manufacturer processor of cocoa and chocolate. Here in the Asia Pacific region, Singapore is our regional headquarters. We manufacture chocolate and compounds, and we sell that to um, food manufacturers. When you mention to people I work in a chocolate factory, they immediately think uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> I have to tell them, look, I'm no Oompa Loompa. <laughs> I've got no clear explanation why I ended up in this business uh, other than fate. Back when I was growing up, all my teachers told my parents, don't do this. Oh, he's got so much more potential and fortunately my parents allowed me the freedom to go for what I, I wanted. And it gives me enormous satisfaction. For many people, in the factory, Sidomongsia <laughs> very heavily involved in inspiration and co-creation, where we help our food manufacturers transform the chocolate into an ice cream or a cookie um, to, to always keep uh, something interesting for the consumer um, in the market. The company creates recipes for food manufacturers, like Magnum ice creams and Kit Kat bars. So today I'm tasting some different chocolates because um, I'm doing some new ice cream stick creations. So I'm just trying to figure out out of these chocolates which one I will be using. Everyone has heard of dark milk and white chocolate. But there's a recent invention, Ruby. When we launched Ruby, a lot of people wanted to try this, not knowing what to expect. We found out from the consumer research, it fulfills a completely different need for intense sensorial delight. All chocolate starts with the main ingredient, cacao beans, which, like the grapes of fine wines, are influenced by the territory they're grown in. Ruby cacao beans grow under unique climate conditions in Ecuador, Brazil and the Ivory Coast. Typically, when the beans are roasted at high temperatures, they turn brown. But when roasted at a lower temperature, their natural characteristics are retained, preserving their color and fruity taste. 
something like Ruby didn't come instantly. Actually, it took 10 years to make sure that we would be able to sell it. And that's only the chocolate as an ingredient. Then that journey continues with uh, the food manufacturers that buy it to make their own products and that bring it to market. People just don't know what complexity their food undergoes and what effort is being done to, to think about the future. So I've got some uh, raspberry and meringue pieces in there. This one has got some pistachio, and that one has got some popping candy. When people eat chocolate, no longer are they happy with just taste. It has to be taste plus something. Taste plus texture, taste plus complexity. So even though you might have something that is completely revolutionary, you need to find ways to make it more interesting each time. Today, Andy's colleagues, Shuan and Pavitra, are going to taste the recipe he's been working on for the past month. It's another round of ruby-coated ice creams. And let me know what you think we should improve. Bon appétit. Popping candy. Yeah. Oh, How do you I find that? <laughs> yeah? Sensation on your tongue. Yeah? That's very unexpected. Yeah. I like the way you put it yeah, in the centre of it rather than in, in the beginning. So yeah. people will be like halfway it's eating an it and then like, yeah. wow, what's this flavour? A new recipe is revised many times before it's ready to be pitched to food manufacturers. The process is part of a push to meet the demands of a population hungry for new flavours. The middle class is expected to grow to 5.3 billion people by 2030. Asia is going to be leading this growth of the rising middle class. So as consumers become more globally aware and affluent, they want to have more diverse types of food. So the future of food is about new tastes and new experiences. And the food industry has to continuously innovate to keep up with demand. Pilot家里宝在全球大概有六千多个秘方 我很想把这个巧克力通通给吃完。巧克力在以前的年代是比较奢侈的，就过年过节我们才能够吃到。现在我每天都吃巧克力。在加入百乐加利宝之前，我本身是在电子行业的一个工程师。在大概九五年的时候，知道百乐加利宝要在亚太区设立它的第一间工厂，我就试下运气去申请这个工作，我就拿到了工作。准备好了，准备好了，准备好了，好了。虽然做了二十五年，可是我还是很喜欢这个
all ready to be shipped to food manufacturers across the Asia Pacific, from Australia and India to Japan. Manufacturing of the future will include a whole plethora of technologies that will transform production into a whole seamlessly integrated process. Okay, Google, turn on the study. Got it. Turning two things on. Singapore needs a large pool of innovators to propel us into the forefront of this revolution. As an engineer, everything you see is opportunity to solve a problem. I'm trying to actually get this robot to clean up the coffee from the table. The chore that cannot be done by human repeatably, we can actually get the robots to do it. I'm a Dyson Digital Motor Engineer. It's a lot of engineer dream job to be here. This is really like playground. Dyson is a technology company. The product we develop is about solving end-user problem by the knowledge of technology. From the first bagless vacuum cleaner to a fan with no blades, Dyson transforms traditional household appliances into futuristic gadgets. The heart of their products are made here in Singapore. At Dyson's largest motor manufacturing facility in the world. We have 300 autonomous robots to do the job of a human. If you look at them, they're really cute. The most favourite part is how we translate the difficult tasks of a human to a robot. They are all able to use quality part without fail. Today, over two million robots are used globally for tasks once carried out by human hands. And that number is set to increase nearly tenfold to 20 million by 2030, allowing for more precise manufacturing of high-tech products. By hand, we first have to grip this copper wire at the right slack and then insert into this slot. If it is too tension, the copper wire will break. Imagine a human got to do this a million times, and then maybe in the beginning of the day you can do it well, but towards the end of the day you'll probably have fatigue. This factory churns out a motor every 2.6 seconds, which adds up to over 12 million a year. So this is actually our first model. It's bulky and heavy, but of course, we also want to improve in terms of the design. We evolved from stainless steel to ceramic shell to make the motor lighter weight. Their newest motor can spin at 125,000 revolutions a minute, over five times faster than a Formula One engine. Transforming traditionally bulky household products into state-of-the-art appliances for the 21st century. When you look at Dyson products, generally we are like the first of its kind. So a lot of times we are working in the unknown. Since 2019, this has served as Dyson's global headquarters, supported by a multi-billion dollar investment plan. Housing 14 different lab and testing facilities, this R&D center develops a wide range of products, from robotics to hair care. Some people, when they bought uh, certain appliances or gadgets, they find that there's some issues here and there, but they decided to live with it because it is somewhat okay. 
but we don't just want to be somewhat okay. We want to be the best in all the aspects. Our philosophy is soft problems that exist for years and problems that people ignore. We see a lot of conventional uh, hairstyling products are using extreme heat to dry hair. What we aim for is to reduce the amount of heat damage. And if your hair is looking healthy, you actually feel that confidence. The R&D investment in Singapore has paid off. Right now, I need to prototype this new barrel, or this new design. Stephen holds patents for three design inventions for hair care products and has become somewhat of a hair aficionado. Recently, I just uh, commented on a colleague like, hey, you just cut your air fringe, which is very popular in Korea. And she was quite surprised, yeah, because usually guys don't notice this. Especially if, uh, if I tell people that I'm an engineer, they won't relate to me as someone aware of the beauty trends. Okay, we test the Type 2 wavy hair first. Okay. Today, he's creating a new barrel attachment for the Dyson Airwrap, which uses physics to deliver next level results. The Dyson Airwrap Styler is actually a multi styling tool. It can curve, wave, straighten, and also smooth out hair by using a powerful airflow to wrap all of the hair. Air usually travels in a straight line. But when a curved surface is introduced, the airflow changes direction. It's a phenomenon called the Coanda effect. Air pushed through six slits creates a vortex that wraps the hair around, making for the perfect curl. What you have at the end of the styling is actually a very natural bouncy curl with the volume still retained and also without the excessive heat damage. I think this one looks okay for a longer barrel. The overall, the curl actually looks more uniform and actually quite uh, consistent as well. 80 prototypes and a year later, the team has launched their new hair curling attachment. We spend so much time from research all the way down to the final product launch. All this is to deliver the best product possible. We know we want to be fast, but sometimes going slow is actually the way to go faster. When friends and family members, they buy Dyson products, their reviews are actually very good and very positive. And this is the kind of satisfaction that I derive from all the babies that I have worked on. Can you actually make this into a toothpiece so you have a better coverage as well? Okay. And then your brake light is actually red, it's very obvious. Mm. Yeah. This place is actually set up four years ago. The gathering of like minded people that is into creating product for solving problem. This studio was launched as a joint collaboration between Dyson and Nanyan Technological University. As the Dyson representative, Yvonne helps the students create prototypes to tackle social issues from public hygiene to road safety. Our team's prototype is actually a bicycle helmet and it has a signal lights at the back. So what we aim to do is actually to make it safer for cyclists uh, on the road because usually now what we have to do is kind of giving hand signals for signaling. I actually wish that when the time I'm in school, I have this because I grew up in a way that there's no space to make failures. When you fail, you actually learn a lot out of it. <laughs> we have provided them the platform to take that leap of faith because if you never get the first step to do it, you will never know where you can push yourself. Stability are not compromised. And also important to... Well, the future of technology is very exciting. It's not just about the robotics or artificial intelligence, but it's also about inspiring a new generation of talent to be innovators, to be technologies, to create a better world. I really wish to see there's more engineering students out there taking up this path so that we can actually solve a lot more problems that's unsolved at the moment.
with the global challenges of climate change, we will need people who can transform science and technology into more sustainable products and services. The vehicles that we drive today have been evolving. The next step in this evolution is actually electric vehicles. I am the lead mechanical engineer here at Scorpio Electric. We are trying to develop and produce Singapore's first electric motorbike. Right, forward, okay, stop. Founded in 2017, Scorpio Electric is one of Singapore's first startups, hoping to revive the nation's dormant automotive industry. Clive, who graduated with an engineering degree two years ago, was one of the first to join. When I tell my kids next time what was my first job, I was tell them, you know, I was there developing electric vehicles when they were still very little on the road, and I was part of that push to change and evolve the entire automotive industry. The team's goal is to convince Singapore's 140,000 motorbike riders to go electric. In line with the country's vision, to run all transport on clean energy by 2040. The opportunity to be at the forefront of something doesn't come by very often. By reducing the number of fossil fuel burning vehicles on the road, we are trying to bring our emissions down. A typical motorcycle runs on a combustion engine that burns gasoline. But 70% of that energy is mostly lost as heat, while emitting harmful pollutants and carbon gases. An electric motorcycle, on the other hand, can convert 80% of a battery's charge to propel the bike with zero gas emissions. Okay. This is the team's third prototype, eight months in the making. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. But with production planned for less than a year away, they need to make sure all parts are working perfectly. All right, base is clear. We're actually about to undertake a performance test. We are definitely looking out for unwanted vibrations and noise that will cause discomfort. Turn off the brakes. All right, can you initiate the test? Three, two, one. Mobility has always given people the choice to be where they want to be whenever they want to be there the perfect riding experience. They invoke a sense of, of power and speed, but at the same time, it needs to be smooth and sublime. Okay, the during the, the test, around 40 to 50 kph, I started to notice some vibration around the rear fender and the tail section. What you can do is you can try strengthening features at the bottom. Uh, triangles underneath this will be good, just like bridges. The vibration of all these small components can actually be felt uh, by the rider. After a while, the rider is able to feel it through his hands, his feet, so it just becomes a nuisance. It's a disappointing result. And back to the drawing board for Clive and the team. When I was young, my dad, he would bring me to the hardware shop and we would buy small things to, to fix around the house. As I grew older, we started to build speakers for our home use, you know, and these speakers were at a point of time as tall as me. So that taught me to understand the engineering that goes on behind the simplest of things that we take for granted. People have already found solutions for the problems that I didn't even thought existed. And that realization made me want to become an engineer to invent these solutions as well. Okay, let's try powering up. Yeah, yeah, it's starting to glow. Yeah. All right. Mm. 
akin to what me and my father did, understanding how things work motivates me in making up my own solution to solve problems that I face. Scorpio Electric is working on Singapore's first electric motorcycle. As lead mechanical engineer, Clive has designed over a hundred of its components, all of which need to undergo multiple tests and adjustments. When people see a bike, they just see a singular product. But how we look at it is an organism. It has hundreds of components all joining together. Each of them has to serve their own purpose. Automotive engineers in Singapore are far and few between. A lot of people ask me, why uh, and, and how do you even do that? It definitely brings me a lot of pride as a young engineer to see this product being developed and being produced by a Singapore team. Okay, initiate test. So I think it's much better than before, yeah. but let's keep on iterating. Uh, let's see what we can do best. Yeah. All right. Sounds like a plan. Even for the tail section that we worked on today, it's a portion that people often take for granted. But this singular part also requires many hours of engineering and even more hours of rigorous testing and validation. Turning Singapore's bikers green is just the first step in the team's plans to expand to the region and beyond. In general, I think people are ready to convert over to electric. That is a push that humankind we must definitely have if we want to see our environment go back to a state where it is desirable. Today, the electric vehicle is still at a very early stage, so the global sales is just a small percentage, but this number is about to flip to become the mainstream in years to come. Energy consumption in Southeast Asia has doubled in the last 20 years and is expected to double again by 2035. As we make our products more energy efficient, we must also transform our energy source from fossil fuels to cleaner energy sources. I like the outdoor because it's nature and uh, I get to enjoy the sun more than sitting in the office. The sun is a natural source of energy. Plants need sunlight to generate food, so they try to maximise their reach of their leaf towards the sun direction. Solar panels work in the same way, capture sunlight and generate electricity. Our purpose is to design and make solar panels that can tap on more energy from the sun. And our aim is to achieve the highest power efficiency in the world. I was in oil and gas company, designing and deploying offshore equipment. Four years ago, I Ching made a dramatic pivot to design solar panels. The accomplishment that I got from this job is much more satisfying because I can help the world and help the environment. Conventional solar panels convert only a fifth of sunlight into electricity. A problem the company is trying to solve through innovative engineering. So we are trying out a new design and we are building mini samples to replicate the actual module. This redesign splits solar cells in two. This is the very conventional type of uh, layout where it's a single full cell. By splitting the cell into half, we are able to uh, reduce the resistance of the module, which end up generating higher power. Solar panels are made up of multiple silicon solar cells, where sunlight is converted into electricity. As current travels through the cells, energy is lost. And if any part of the panel is shaded, power generation comes to a standstill. 
But by splitting the cells and module in half, they can still produce electricity in partial shade, while the smaller size results in lower resistance and less power loss. So this is for half cut. You can see the power is 4.8. It's for the full cut. The power is 3.3. So the results shows that the half cut cell is in fact more powerful as compared to the full cell. The company is the first to introduce half cut cell technology into their solar panels, which increased energy output by over 2%. So 1% to 2% uh, might be quite negligible, but if you sum up the amount of energy, right, it's able to power your house probably for um, one day. Today, REC's solar panels are one of the most efficient in the world. And they're made right here in Singapore. Established in 2010, this is one of the largest integrated solar manufacturing complexes in the world. It produces more than 4 million solar panels a year, capable of churning out 1.8 gigawatts, enough to power millions of homes. Solar needs to be very competitive in order to make it very attractive for people to adopt the technology. My role here is ultimately to make sure that the solar panels that are coming out is of good quality without defects. Wow, so this looks bad. Uh. Yeah, uh, from what you can see that actually the, the gripper plate have cracked and this will result in the wafers not able to be stuck in and hold properly. If even one of these damaged cells are used, it will affect the performance of the whole panel. So every time when the problem occurs, of course, the first thing we'll go in, recover the tool as fast as possible. Being in the manufacturing industry is definitely not easy. It comes with stress to ensure quality products are coming out, life running consistently. After four hours, the team manages to rectify the issue and production resumes. Looks good. I think we managed to recover this on time. Well done. The solar panels manufactured here will be exported to countries like Japan, China, and the United States. The most satisfying part of my job is to be able to contribute to environment. I, I like to dive a lot. When you go into the sea, you start to see things like rubbish on the floor. It makes you feel very sad. Why is the environment like that? I hope that solar will become a, one of the main source of energy. We can explore seas, uh, building on top of the HDB, and uh, that will really help to make the country green and clean. And the module is deflecting about 35 mm over here. Yeah, and then 35.4 mm. To be reliable, the panels need to withstand a variety of weather conditions. From torrential rain and scorching heat to sub-zero cold. No is on top of the module, so this is the reason why we are pushing the module downwards. Wind will be acting upwards onto the module. Yeah. I no think more. this module is good. Yeah. My dream is that we are able to totally replace non-renewable sources for energy with solar panels within the next 50 years. A lot more work needs to be done in order to make that happen. So over the years, solar panel has become a lot more efficient in converting solar energy into electricity. The price of modules has also dropped exponentially. In many places around the world, solar is already cheaper than even coal as an energy source. There's growing awareness for the need to use renewable energy sources. Solar panels becomes one option that people look at seriously. Sustainability is an issue that cuts across all industries, including the construction sector. 
what they're looking at is to move towards a cleaner building environment, reducing uh, dust and noise pollution. A home is not just a box. A perfect home is where you enjoy the house, which was built according to your own taste. How do we shape the perfect home and make it sustainable? If you look at history, construction industry has been evolving over the years. This is actually what draws me into engineering. It started with the pyramid of Egypt built from stones, the use of structural steel in bridges, and of course, the wonderful uh, invention of reinforced concrete. And reinforced concrete has evolved further to create what we call now PPVC. PPVC, or prefabricated, prefinished volumetric construction, is a construction method where rooms are fitted with internal finishes and fittings at a factory. They are then transported to be installed on site. Compared to conventional methods, it reduces necessary manpower by 40%, as well as the build's total carbon footprint. I've been working in this industry for 25 years now, so it's more than half of my uh, life. Every time you see your finished job, there's a inner satisfaction in you, although people may not know the people who have hard works and labors behind it. You look at the skyline, every time you pass by, it makes you proud that, yes, I was there when this building was being built, and I am part of that. Today, the team is taking a step further. Their latest challenge? to build the world's tallest prefabricated building. Rising 56 stories in the heart of Bukit Merah, a densely populated neighborhood in Singapore. Maybe people are saying we are crazy, we built 56 story in PPVC, but our job is to make it work. And, and here you have two bedrooms. Two bedrooms, so you have one, two, three. Three modules. Well, normally for two bedroom, you have three modules. The residential skyscraper will be made up of over 3,000 individual modules. So we design PPVC modules, we don't just design boxes. Because we have to look at the functionality of every unit, whether it's a bedroom or toilet or kitchen. So only services we're crossing now is the water and electrical and aircon. Yes. All the design have to come at the earlier stage because you have to embed them into the module. Before the modules can be manufactured, details of the inbuilt services, such as water piping and electrical wiring, need to be accurately mapped out to the finest detail. If all these things have not been planned carefully, and you find out there's a problem on site, then that's very disastrous. You have to cast a new module and then fit in all the new services according to the correct one. A home consists of up to four modules that vary between the kitchen, living room, and bedrooms. Each unit comes equipped with water pipes and electrical wires. After manufacture, they are moved to a factory, where furnishings such as floor tiles and air conditioning units are installed. Transporting them is a huge challenge. They are so big that if the roads aren't wide enough, they need a police escort. Once at the site, they'll be assembled by a crane one at a time, like Lego. Today, the modules designed by Sonny and his team have arrived at the factory. Weighing up to 35 tons, 
customized cranes are needed to lift them into place. Once you see it in physical form, you'll be amazed. This module will consist of your living room, and then it will lead out to your balcony, so it'll be open to, to the sky. Now, the team needs to furnish these modules to turn them into homes. I从小就喜欢观察建筑，在我小的时候，我妈妈买了一本呃高地的书给我，呃，当时我真的很开心，因为我非常喜欢呃世界各地的建筑，所以我就每天翻阅查看。我想这就是呃从小培养起来呃这
sensors are devices that extract information from the surroundings and translate them to a back-end system. SA Engineering makes lots of sensors. We design and manufacture in-house and we sell them all over the world. Ray has been designing sensors for over a decade. Since I was a child, I love magnets. I was very intrigued by how uh, an invisible force can influence the things around it. I spent lots of time playing with them, all kinds of magnets, even building electromagnets as I got older. And that led me to study electromagnetics. If you think about sensors, the foundation is all based on electromagnetics. To date, Ray and his team have developed and deployed millions of sensors across 70 cities worldwide. They are in systems that can detect a number of environmental cues, from air quality to weather conditions. Ray is now designing sensors for smart lighting systems in residential areas. Smart lighting is a system of lights that can communicate and talk to one another. The circuit board here is like your brain. The sensor here is like your eyes. Your eyes will take in the information from the surroundings, passes it on via signals into the brain, and it analyzes it. Lighting accounts for almost 20% of global energy consumption. A switch to using sensors could see a huge impact. When a person comes close, High-frequency signals automatically detect the motion and sends a signal to the lightning node to automatically brighten up. When the person leaves, the lights will dim, saving up to 60% of energy. The current challenge is to calibrate the sensors to accurately detect human presence. OK, uh, let's go a little bit slower at 500 millimetres per second. We need to be able to sense most types of human motion, whether it be an uh, elderly person that's walking slowly, a young child, or even a cyclist that's cycling past. So at one point, we found it particularly difficult to detect uh, elderly that were walking very slowly. Children is another ball game. Uh, they were fast moving, erratic. Let's speed, Let's speed up. up. 1,500 millimeters per second. Okay. Yeah. We went through at least four to five iterations, okay, and uh, still counting. As we uh, continue to improve the reliability, it never stops. The team's smart lighting system has been deployed in over 10 estates across Singapore, including TechGi, where over 10,000 sensors have been installed. And plans are in place to roll it out to seven more towns by 2024. In fact, sensors should be used uh, everywhere, even more than what we are using it for now. The needs for sensors just keep increasing. So lots more sensors will be developed with more and more capability and, and, and features. And it will keep going on for the next 20 years, even after I'm retired. OK, good. Okay, can cover. Okay. United Tech Construction is building the world's tallest prefabricated building. The 56-storey residential apartment will consist of over 3,000 modules, all furnished in this factory. You can't tell me this is the highest 
，它是一个一个分开，只有到它拼装在现场安装的时候，当它一层一层叠上去，你才会真正看见这个建筑它的美丽。Once 80% of the furnishing work is complete, these modules will be transported to the building site in Bukit Merah, where they will be installed to create over 900 new homes. Today, we are building the first 1,000 modules. We use the weight control to put it down. Then, we put it slowly down, like a Lego. Please proceed to lift up the module now. Thank you. Each module can weigh up to 35 tons, approximately 20 times the weight of a car. They have to be hoisted on heavy-duty cranes that can support its weight under strong winds at altitude. Stand by uh, in position. Uh, module is on the way up now. This module needs to be lifted to the 23rd floor, 80 meters above the ground. Although Before it is fixed in place, the team needs to ensure that the gap between the neighboring modules doesn't exceed two centimeters. Anything beyond would threaten the building's stability. Once in position, the module is sealed in place. Yeah, it's all good. Okay, good job. When I see it getting higher, I think it's a hard work. Although now we're on the 23rd floor, but after a year, you'll see it on the 56th floor. This makes me very happy and very excited. Yeah, it's all good. Okay, good job. Once the modules are installed, the team takes another four days to complete them. Once the modules are installed, the team takes another four days to make the final touches, transforming it into a home. Now we're seeing not only is it a PPVC project, it's also a company, it's also a person's home. It makes me feel very warm. Now I think human creativity is not limited. In the future, there will be other ways to exceed our technology. I think the Singapore construction industry has come a long way. With the adoption of new technology, it does open up the scope to be a lot more innovative in the way we do things. There is definitely room for it to be positioned as a very modern industry. Three D printing in construction is a game changer. The machines can work twenty four seven with very limited manpower, and every house can be built differently. Every unit can have different configurations, without any strain to the manufacturing process. Set up in twenty sixteen, this center costs eighty million Singapore dollars and looks into translating 3D printing technology across different industries, including construction. 3D printing is actually making objects layer by layer. You can design any model that you want, and the finished product is the exact replica of what we have on the computer. 3D printing is not just about reducing manpower, 
It's also about sustainability. The production of cement contributes 4 to 8% of the carbon footprint, and we want to use less cement if possible. We use Joe polymers, which is actually fly ash from incinerator plants as a cement substitute. In 2019, the team successfully printed a bathroom unit in just nine hours using a sustainable concrete mix. A quicker and cleaner construction than using conventional methods. When we first started, we were printing small things, but we thought construction, wow, you know, it's like a bit far-fetched. This was beyond our wildest imagination. This technology now is not too far away, but we are hoping to ramp this up commercially. Now, they are pushing the capability of the technology even further in attempting a new design. A curved wall. I think you can load it up and then let's run the machine. OK. For 3D printing, one of the challenges is actually understanding the material. It needs to be able to flow well as you print, but it has to harden quick enough before the next layer comes on. If the material has not hardened and more layers are stacked on top of it, the whole thing could just slump. Today's experiment is a success. So there's no bulge, there's no uh, breakout, Correct. no slump. Good. The surface looks good. So we can be more adventurous going forward. We can, we can have more overhangs, deeper recesses maybe in future. We want to be able to build full-length structures, maybe even multi-storey structure. With some hybrid technologies, the possibilities are endless. 3D printing of houses is just like one of the technologies that you see in science fiction movies. And similar to uh, flying cars today, it's becoming the reality. We will see a renaissance in terms of manufacturing. Uh, very exciting innovations that will come up. Singapore has invested a lot in terms of our research and development, especially in the sciences area. Today, Singapore is a very attractive destination for pharmaceutical companies. When you enter the production area, uh, we don't see any uh, conveyor belt or products moving along the line. It looks very really quiet uh, on the outside. Most of the actions are contained uh, in tanks. We operate 24-7 because the diseases doesn't uh, wait, yeah, so neither should we. Novartis is a global pharmaceutical company. Medicine is constantly evolving with the needs of the society. So, release the cramp. Okay, let's do a quick check to ensure there's no leak. Novartis manufactures biologics, a type of medicine used to treat patients with severe diseases, such as asthma and skin conditions. Okay, starting. It is produced using living organisms. Biologics is still uh, relatively new in current manufacturing of medicine. It can offer a more targeted treatment compared to the traditional medicine uh, who's uh, typically used to uh, relieve the symptoms. Unlike conventional medicine made using chemicals, biologics are biological medicines derived from living cells. They are engineered to bind to specific areas of the body's immune system offering an effective treatment for a variety of conditions with fewer side effects. But as they can only be manufactured inside living cells, they are a challenge to produce. This space is our cell bank. So this is where we retrieve our cells. Vials of cells are preserved at minus 150 degrees Celsius each containing 10 million genetically modified cells to kickstart production. Cells are like mini factories 
They are the ones hard at work producing treatments for our patients. My role is to culture cells from a small volume to a very, very large volume. It takes a lot of passion to work 12 hours every day. I enjoy knowing that my cells are growing well and growing good. I feel proud to be part of this new industry because it is full of innovation and also gives me an opportunity to help um, patients live a better life. At this point in time, biologics is still relatively new and in the future, there will be more treatments for more diseases and more people are able to benefit from it. In an intricate process that takes 45 days, the batch is upscaled from 10 million cells in a small vial of 2 milliliters into 10 trillion cells in massive 10,000 liter bioreactors, which will produce 80,000 doses of medicine. Just like all living things, these cells need oxygen, the right temperature levels and nutrients to thrive. If conditions aren't optimal, they could affect the cell's growth. The perfect outcome for me is uh, producing a batch every week. What we are doing here is we are preparing food for the cells. We make sure that the nutrients are way to the correct formulation for the cells to eat and grow. The cells are the babies of the manufacturing team, so we make sure that they grow healthily. But taking care of living organisms is no walk in the park. The foam looks a bit high. Yeah, it's quite high. Foaming occurs because the cells release uh, carbon dioxide, get entrained as buffer at the surface and create a barrier for oxygen to reach the cell. Without oxygen, they could die. The cells are the heartbeat of the plant. Without the cells, we made nothing. The foam looks a bit high. Bioengineer Xiao Xiong is well into his shift. His team is manufacturing a type of medicine called biologics. This is an alternative treatment for chronic diseases such as asthma and various skin conditions. The medicine is highly complex and can only be produced using genetically modified cells under strict parameters. But when foam levels are high, oxygen is unable to dissolve, suffocating the living cells. The cells are just like our babies, yeah. so if the cells are not growing well, we'll be disappointed. I think we should add them to foam. It's good to go. OK, let's proceed with the antifoam. The cells in these 10,000-litre tanks are 30 days into the process and ready to be harvested. The team must react quickly to avoid a massive loss. If the foam level is not controlled, this means that one month of the effort will be wasted if the production bioreactor has to be discarded. The foam has subsided, I think we can stop. With levels now stabilised, they need to ensure the cells are growing well. The pharmaceutical industry is very intense because our product eventually impacts the lives of patients. We are here checking how many cells are alive. So today we have 97% viability. This is a good result. As the genetically modified cells thrive and proliferate in the tank, they produce the medicine. Once enough is made, the drug is then filtered out and purified and stored in cryo vessels at minus 20 degrees Celsius, each containing 100 litres of medicine, amounting to 80,000 doses. When I tell people I make medicine, they appear very curious. Wow, you know, uh, medicine will cure my illnesses and then you are able to make them. I'm no way comparable to the true frontline worker. 
I contribute to the industry in a different way. I really like what I'm doing because I can offer someone I might not know a cure for them to have a better life. Motorcycle riding is the lifestyle of Southeast Asians. If you look at the big cities, there's no starry nights. There's so much smoke in the sky. So we want to give that back to the people. I've always wanted to work around automotive. That's my passion in life. So making an electric bike is an easy decision. It's an opportunity that doesn't come twice. Beyond electric mobility, our bike must strike a good balance between the animalistic drive from going faster and appealing to the digital natives. And that means providing smart features because connectivity is like the gateway to everything that is out there. Scorpio Electric is building Singapore's first electric motorcycle. The bike is installed with over 10 sensors and a GPS tracker that can provide real-time data to riders through a mobile app. We'll do 30 now. The team is putting their prototype on the road for a test run. Joseph, so maintain 30 kilometers per hour down the street. 30, 30. We know that going forward, connectivity will be what is expected in motorcycle experience. And the goal tonight is to understand whether this tracker and system works. We want to test more of more of this on, under different conditions, make sure that they are reliable all the time. The bike sensors can monitor speed, location and battery status. Okay, that's 13. That's about, yeah, 0.9 yeah. of a kilowatt. The sensors are heating up just fine. Technology. Now it's so much interlinked. We don't go into a new location without looking at the maps. All the big data, it will be able to calculate range you have left, where's the nearing charging station if you need one, how's the traffic going to be like between you and where you are going. The next lap, let's do 50 and level 3 brake reduction. OK. All right, uh, this next lap, you maintain 50 km per hour and do hard braking at the gantry. I repeat, 50 km per hour. Okay, that's 40, that's 45, that's 50. Wow, The motorbike has been through 10,000 kilometers of test runs. This is one of its final laps. We know that a couple of things today. Uh, number one, the tracker definitely works. It can track your position just now quite accurately. The speed is pretty accurate. I think we are, we are very happy with the result, as long as you feel that the balance is all right. Even I throttle up or throttle down, it gives us good response. The first bike is almost ready to hit the production line four years since the company's inception. I've been with the company almost since the start. We've seen the team grow. This is our baby. But I want our guys to be proud of themselves that they've made something extraordinary. There definitely is this swelling pride in the team here in Singapore, you know, that we, we are developing a homegrown brand, making its mark on the automotive world. In the current state in the world today, we are faced with enormous challenges. Let's take a look at the results. It requires a new generation of talent to create a better world. In the decades ahead, we will see the transformation of the world and even the reinvention of humanity. It's a great feeling to be the one pioneering for the next years to come. To me, it's a mission to do something that is helpful for the world. I just believe that with um, the bright mind that's out there, there's a future of unknown and surprises. Everything is possible and nothing is sure. If you persevere, you will come up with something that is completely revolutionary. Let's go further. What can we do? What can we add? The sky is the limit.